Well, over the next four sessions, we're going to continue our study of Isaiah. And in particular, we're going to be looking at Isaiah's chapter 49 through to chapter 52. But what we're actually going to do is we're going to stop at verse 12 of Isaiah chapter 52. And that's because when you get into verse 13, it's really part of the next chapter, uh, the fourth servant song. So God willing, we'll leave that for 2024. And I think it's worth just reminding ourselves very briefly. We'll have to just do a couple of reminders because it's been quite a bit of time since we've looked at Isaiah. Just where, uh, where we're looking at fits into the context of the overall prophecy. And in 2017, Brother Peter Schwarzkopf gave me this summary of Isaiah. And I think it's a really good, very quick snapshot of how Isaiah is as a, a total prophecy and I guess just at a high level, we know that it fits into those two main parts of the book where you've got uh, chapters 1 to 39, which are all about Yahweh's judgment and character, and then chapters 40 to 66, which is Yahweh's comforts and, and redemption. And over the past three years, we've been looking at the section that's highlighted in orange there on the screen, uh, all about redemption promised and Israel's deliverance. And... Just very briefly then, so in 2020, Brother Bruce Gerd covered chapter 40 through to chapter 42, verse 7. And Brother Bruce introduced us to the servant prophecies, showing that the primary audience were the Israelites in captivity in Babylon. And Yahweh controls the future and will provide ultimate salvation through his servant, son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Brother Dan Hill continued looking at the servant prophecies in 2021 and we considered chapters 42, verse 8, through to verse, chapter 44, where we looked at the idea that the nation of Israel, who are God's witness, but they're deaf, they can't hear, they're blind and they can't see. They had problems with idol worship. And despite all of this, God would restore them. And then Brother Lee Samuel in 2022 took us through Isaiah 45 to 48. And we considered the historical context of those four chapters and what the nation went through, the lessons that the nation should have learned and therefore the lessons that we should learn from these sections in Isaiah. And if you glance back at Isaiah chapter 48 and verse 20, the section of the prophecy concludes with Yahweh having redeemed his servant Jacob. It's a foregone conclusion because God never fails at what he promises it's a message of hope to those in captivity. God's plan for redemption and deliverance has been laid out. The idols have been thoroughly exposed. Cyrus has been explained. Babylon is dealt with. And then they're going to go forth from Babylon. And they're going to flee from the Chaldeans. And you've got that beautiful vision that they're going to declare it with a voice of singing. And chapter 49 moves into the next section of the prophecy shown here in orange, as we move from redemption promised and Israel's deliverance to redemption provided and Israel's deliverer. You'll notice there's now a, a change of focus in chapter 49. It's no more focused on idols. There's no more focus on Cyrus and, and Babylon, except for a reference in chapter 52, the focus now turns on the message of consolation for Zion and the servant's redemptive work. And to begin looking at Isaiah 49, we really need to get our heads around the major sections of this chapter because it's quite a long chapter. The thing that makes it slightly more difficult is the unhelpful way that the translators have split the chapters for chapters 49 through to 52, actually, especially when you're trying to understand the various sections of the prophecy. So to help us, let's just start by having a look at the chapter splits of Isaiah 49 and 50 combined into one slide. And we're going to do the same thing when we look at chapters 51 and 52 in our third night. But what we have here is we have a uh, uh, the major sections of the prophecy, if you're looking at it from a, a chapter breakdown where you really need to combine chapters 49 to 50. So there's five distinct ver uh, sections in chapter 49. The second servant song, 
Yahweh gives comfort to the servant, praise to Yahweh, Zion's reaction and Yahweh's response, Yahweh's promise to end captivity permanently. And then in chapter 50, you've got three distinct sections as well. Yahweh further addresses Zion's accusations. You've got the third servant song and then Yahweh's instructions to follow the servant. So that's the view if you wanted to look at it from the chapter split. So let's just ignore the chapter splits for a second and let's just see how we would group them if we were looking at the different sections of the prophecy. So we've got the exact same headings. The only difference is we've changed the color coding and now you can see that there are four separate groups of color codings on the screen here, which I think are a good representation of the four different sections of the prophecy covering chapters 49 and 50. So we've got the section in green, which is covered in chapter 49 verses 1 to 12. And this deals with the servant's song and Yahweh's comfort to the servant. So it's, it's a very distinct section together. The next section, which is in purple, is just one verse of praise to Yahweh. And we'll have a look and we'll see why that's really in a section on its own, that one single verse. And then the next section, which is in orange, takes us from chapter 49, verse 14, through to chapter 50, verse 3. So you can see why the chapter splits, we're just ignoring them for the purpose of the main components of the prophecy. And this whole section is covering Zion's feelings of, rede of rejection, Yahweh's response to Zion, a question about whether Yahweh can really end captivity and his response to that. And then we've got this final response from Yahweh to Zion's accusations that they're making to him in, that sec in those sections in orange in chapter 49. And then the final section in blue finishes off chapter 50, verses 4 to 11, which is the third servant song and Yahweh's instructions to follow the servant. So that's how I would think about the next two chapters. I would think about those four groups that uh, are split up to make the, the sum of those two chapters. And in terms of what we're going to cover tonight, so tonight we're going to cover the first two sections in green and purple. And then next class in a fortnight's time, we're going to cover that other section there, the, the two bits in orange and in blue. And then we'll look at the later chapters further down the track. So let's just start off by having a look at the first section of the prophecy, the servant's song and Yahweh giving comfort to the servant. So I mentioned a little bit earlier that Brother Bruce Gerd introduced us to the concept of the four servant songs or poems, as he called them back then in 2020. In fact, this is the slide that Brother Bruce showed when he was giving us a summary of those servant poems, the servant songs. And one of the things that I've done in my Bible, which I highly encourage everyone to do, is to go through those four servant songs and put a colored border around them because then they really pop out when you're having a look through Isaiah. You see, oh yeah, there's a servant song. I've got that one bordered and I can um, have a look at that one and consider the other four. So there's something for, for some Bible marking homework during the week. And the four servant songs are all about Christ as the individual servant. Songs one and four, so the first one and the last one, they're in the third person. So it's he and him and his. And they, all, they both start with, behold my servant. Songs two and three, the middle two that we're going to have a look at, is all in the first person. So it's I and me and my, acknowledging Adonai Yahweh. And here's an overview of those four servant songs. If you take the headings that Brother Bruce used, and now what we've done is we've overlaid that with a summary from Brother Jim Luke's little booklet entitled Behold My Servant. And he, in that booklet, gives us a summary of each of the four servant songs. And I think this is all useful because in the context of us considering two of the four servant songs over the next four weeks. 
So we've got the first servant song, which Brother Bruce covered in Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 7. It's the first hint that the servant will suffer and be given as a covenant for the people. It's all about victory through submission and salvation through suffering. The second one is his call from the womb. It's an open lament over the servant's apparent failure and assured by Yahweh that he is chosen and he will help him establish the earth. And then the third servant song, the responsiveness of the servant. The servant would be subject to personal abuse, yet he retains his supreme confidence in Yahweh. And then the fourth servant song, the final elevation of the son, shows that the servant would be subject to a violent death, but afterward he would be exalted. So there's a good summary that we can take away of each of those servant songs. As I said, we'll cover song number two and three in our sessions tonight and, and then in the next fortnight. And just so we can be reminded as well, here is the summary of what Brother Bruce said concerning that first servant song, Qualities of the Son, broken into two verses. The first verse is covered in Isaiah 42 verses 1 to 4, and it shows what the servant would do and how the servant would feel. The servant doesn't feel particularly confident. He's not a forceful person. He's patient and caring. He doesn't trust in himself but his work is to bring judgment. And then the second verse of that second song, the servant is given confidence by God that his work must be achieved. And you know, the second servant song that we're going to look at really progresses the themes that are covered in that first servant song. And in verse one of chapter 49, the servant song commences and we've got, the servant speaking here, listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. So the me is the servant. The Lord Jesus Christ, isles, and people from far to listen and to hearken. The word isles here is used in the sense of countries beyond the sea. They're a distant or an unknown region. And when we reach verse 6, we're going to see that it's talking about all corners of the earth and it's really the Gentile nations. And, you know, for, for us sitting here today, thousands of years later, we can be grateful that people from those distant places heard and responded to that call. In Romans 10 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And because people heard the call, Paul goes on to say in Romans 11, that the Gentiles have been grafted into the vine of salvation. And we're sitting here today because the word of the servant spread across distant isles and lands and encompasses both Jew and Gentile. And verses 1 and 2 of chapter 49 outline the four qualities of the servant. The beautiful thing about this section is the servant is saying that Yahweh has given me these four qualities. Yahweh has called me from the womb. Yahweh has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Yahweh has hid me in the shadow of his hand and in his quiver. Yahweh has made me a polished shaft. Everything that the servant has, it, even his very characteristics, have been shaped and provided by the Father. So let's just consider each one of those in relation to our Lord Jesus Christ. The first one, called from the womb. The servant was called from the womb. And when we have a look at some of the Bible references that are on the screen there, we can see how this applies to the Lord Jesus Christ. He had a divine calling. It's a calling that was first mentioned in Genesis 3 and verse 15, that he would bruise the head of the serpent. It's a calling that's mentioned in Luke 2 and verse 21, when it says that the angel had given him a name before he was conceived in the womb. It's a calling that's described in John 1 and verse 1, as the word was with God in the beginning, and then verse 14, the word became flesh. So here we have the divine calling of the Lord Jesus Christ before he was born. 
The second thing it says is that he had a mouth like a sharp sword. That's the second one. The servant describes how God has made his mouth like a sharp sword. And, you know, that's exactly what we find about the Lord Jesus Christ. He always spoke the truth. He always had an answer that was right. And he had an answer that was exactly what the people around him needed to hear. Consider some of these references relating to our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't shy away from defending the truth. We've got the words of John 7 verse 46, never man spake like this. That theme of the mouth with a, a sharp sword is carried all the way into the future in Revelation 1 and verse 16 that he had out of his mouth when a sharp two-edged sword. In Hebrews 4 and verse 12, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the Lord Jesus Christ would have used his words when someone was saying something that was not the truth, and he would have had to cut them down to size. But he always did it in love. Matthew 10 and verse 34, Think not that I have come to send peace on earth. I have not come to send peace, but a sword. Perhaps this is a reference to the sword, the two-edged sword, the sharp sword in his mouth. He was hidden by God in his shadow, in his quiver, is under the protection of God. In verse 2, the servant acknowledges that he's hidden by God. And the idea is really that he's protected from danger or that he's secluded himself within the shadow of his father. And, you know, Yahweh protected the Lord Jesus Christ through all stages of his life. So here we have on the screen three stages of his life where we can see that protection of Yahweh where he was hidden in his shadow. Matthew 2 and verse 13, at his birth, when the angel tells Joseph to flee into Egypt because they seek the young child to destroy him. There's a protection. Psalm 91 verses 11 to 12, during his life, you know, the tempter tried to use this against the Lord Jesus Christ. But in Psalm 91, it says that the angels would look over him, keep him in his ways, bear him up, lest he should dash his foot against a stone. So protection through his life. And Psalm 16, verse 10, after his death, still under the shadow of the protection of his father, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And the fourth one, is that the, uh, the servant is a polished shaft. You know, Brother Jamie demonstrated to us a couple of nights ago the, the arrow, and you'll remember that Brother Jamie shot the arrow um, into a target, and what Brother Jamie was demonstrating was that the arrow can miss the mark or it can fall short of the mark. Well, here we have another aspect of that demonstration. If you've ever shot an arrow and the arrow itself is bent or it's not perfect, it's, it's rough or it's uneven, it's got some imperfections in it, if that's the arrow, it's not going to hit the target. There's, there's a, a, a great chance it'll, it'll miss completely. It has to be perfectly straight. It's got to be perfectly polished and not have any imperfections so that it can hit the target. The word polished here is barua. B-A-R-U-R. And it can mean anything which is cleansed or purified. Here it might denote an arrow which is cleansed from rust. It's polished. It's made bright. And that's exactly what we find about our Lord Jesus Christ, that he was free from rust, totally free from rust, polished and made bright. First of Peter 2, verses 21 to 23, Christ also suffered for us who leaves us an example that we should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was there guile found in his mouth. Hebrews 4 verse 15 tells us he was tempted like we are, yet without sin. In Hebrews 7 verse 26, for such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. He's a polished shaft. 
You know, these four qualities from verses 1 to 2 are really the qualifications of an ideal servant. So our theme for the year is growing up into Christ. And if we want to grow up into Christ, then we need to grow to be a servant of God like the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we want to do that, then perhaps these four qualifications are a good place to start. Now, if you're observant, you'll notice on the slide that it says the eight qualifications of an ideal servant. So what we've got there is we've got four qualifications from the servant that we've just looked at now. If you want to find out what the other four are, then you'll need to come to the next session on Isaiah because we're going to find another four qualifications of the ideal servant in the next servant song. So for tonight, we've got the four qualifications of the servant of God taken from the, this second song. So they've got a divine calling. To be a servant of Yahweh, we need to be called by him. You know, and I think that we can safely say that no one has simply stumbled into the hall tonight accidentally. We're here because Yahweh has called us out of darkness, each and every one of us. That's why 1 Peter 2, verses two to, verses 9 to 10 says, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvellous light. The second qualification is that the servant has incisive speech. Our mouth needs to be surrendered to God. A servant of God will only speak the truth and speak the words of God. We can't shy away from speaking the truth, even if it makes us feel uncomfortable, especially if we're correcting wrong behavior or wrong doctrine. But we should do it in love, just like Jesus did. But the servant should always speak the truth. That's why Ephesians 4 verse 29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. The third qualification is seclusion from the world. We need to seek out the Father and be hidden from the world, staying within his, the shadow of our Father in heaven. You know, we can't be a, a servant of God and a servant of the world. That's why the servant himself said in Matthew 6, verse 24, you can't serve God and mammon. And why James 4 and verse 4 says that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. We need to hide under the shadow of the Father. We need to hide in his quiver. We need to find seclusion away from the world wherever we can. And it's not going to be possible all the time because we are in the world, but we shouldn't be a part of it. And the fourth qualification is that the servant needs to be freed from rust. We need to try to keep ourselves bright and clean, constantly working on overcoming our weaknesses. Sure, we're going to fail. Human nature says we'll fail. We're not going to be able to live up to the perfect example of Christ. But we know that we've got the forgiveness of our Father who can cleanse us of our sins. Second of Corinthians 7 verse 1 says, Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. So the servant of God is going to try their best in mortality to be freed from rust until the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, when they'll be totally cleansed with divine nature. So we can take the opportunity during the week, in the weeks to come, to consider these qualities of the servant and to see how we're applying them in our, our own lives. And we'll see the next four in our next class. So the song continues in verse 3, with the servant reflecting on the words of Yahweh. You know, a lot has been written about why Messiah here is called Israel. Plenty of analysis on why it's not talking about the nation of Israel, why it's not talking about the prophet Isaiah. But, you know, here's the important point. If you look up the Hebrew, it's the word Yisrael. And Strong says it means he will rule with God. Another translation is Prince of God. And that's exactly an appropriate title for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the antitype of Jacob 
for Israel. His future destiny is to rule the earth as the prince of God. And his whole life was focused on giving glory to God in the, in the heaven. And here we have some of the references where we're told in verse 3 that the servant through whom I would be glorified. And here we have some references where the Lord Jesus Christ gave glory or showed glory unto God. John 11 verse 4 Jesus said, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. John 7 verse 11, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes into heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. And Acts 3 verse 13 talks of the Lord Jesus Christ as he as God has glorified his son, Jesus. And Matthew 15 and verse 31, when the multitude sees him healing all these people, they glorified the God of Israel. So here we have him who has given glory to God and whom God has also given glory to as well. You know, in Hosea 11 verse 1, the prophet says concerning Israel, it says, when Israel was a child, then I loved him. And called my son out of Egypt. But have a look at what Matthew does. Matthew links and connects the dots for us and applies this to the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 2. He says, They departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So Isaiah 49, verse 3. Thou art my servant, O Israel, talking of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in verse 4, we really get a, a glimpse into the thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's two thoughts that are going through his mind. The first thought in verse 4 is that I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for naught and in vain. It's the Lord's despondency at the lack of response. But the second thing is, is that God is endorsing his judgment and his works. Surely my judgment is with Yahweh and my work with my God. You know, one of the trials that the Lord Jesus Christ would have faced every single day during his ministry would have been discouragement. The Lord Jesus Christ was the only way to salvation And yet Isaiah 53 and verse 3 says that he was despised and rejected of men. The Lord Jesus Christ performed countless miracles. And yet Isaiah 53 and verse 4 says they esteemed him stricken and smitten of God. The Lord Jesus Christ's work with the nation was commissioned by God. And yet John 1 verse 11 says his own people did not receive him. The Lord Jesus Christ came to build a people who were worthy of the kingdom. And yet Matthew 21 verse 42 says that he was the stone that the builders rejected. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke the truth and only the truth. And yet in Psalm 116 verse 11 takes us into the mind of Christ when he says, I set in my alarm, all men are liars. And you really get to understand why the Lord responded this way with these two responses and this despondency. When you consider just how quickly the people turned away from him. When you get a chance, read John chapter 6. In that single chapter and in the space of about 24 hours, he goes from feeding the 5,000 people and he's, he's trying to depart and find a spot where he can go and 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 hide away because they want to make him their king to the very next day when after his speech on eternal life, many of his disciples turned back and walked no more with him. And that happened within a space of 24 hours. So that's the reason why the servant is despondent here in Isaiah 49 because the result of his ministry were not proportionate to the effort that he put in and to the veracity of the claims that he was making. But you know what? The servant had perfect 
confidence in God. He had a a calm and an unwavering assurance of his favor. He never doubted that God approved of his plans and the labors of his life. He never became uh, disheartened. He never threw in the towel and gave up. He calmly committed himself to God. He didn't attempt to avenge himself for being rejected for the pain that he suffered. He left it all in the hands of God, knowing that he was doing the work of the Father, knowing that God would be the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And, you know, even though the Lord Jesus Christ had no success with the nation as a whole, he still had success with individuals, both Jew and Gentile. And and we see that continue in the book of Acts, where we have thousands of people converted and ecclesias being established all over the world. So, you know, his work was blessed. And I think we learn a lot from verse 4. We learn that there's going to be times when our labor and our effort and our self-sacrificing activities might appear to be unsuccessful. It might be in our preaching or in our interactions with another person. And, you know, it's normal to feel disappointed when the reaction is not commensurate with either the veracity of the message or the effort that we've put into it. The second thing we learn is that if we think that at present things appear to be unsuccessful, well, faithful labor will ultimately do good because all honest effort in the cause of God is likely to be rewarded with success. The third thing we learn is those who labor faithfully can commit their labors to God and be assured that their work is going to be accepted by him. And finally, the fourth thing we learn is we're assured that if we devote all of our strength and talent and time in God's servant, a service, that we'll find peace as our Lord did and that our work will ultimately be blessed no matter how small. And that's really how the song finishes in verses 5 to 6. When you read verses 5 and 6, we read the majority of verse 5 as being in parentheses. So on the screen here, that section in red is is really to be read as if it's in parentheses because it's really summarizing some of the thoughts from the previous verses. So, you know, he says, form me from the womb, that's linked to verse 1. To bring Jacob again, that's linked to the title of Israel in verse 2. Though Israel be not gathered is linked to the reason why he's disappointed in verse 4. Yet shall I be glorious is linked to verse 3. God shall be my strength is linked to verses 2 and 4. And the servant conveys in verse 6 the words of Yahweh. You know, there's two different ways that you can read verse 6. Two different sort of emphases, but you know, they actually give the same meaning, really. Some render it, uh, render this verse in the sense that it's too small a thing to just raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved of Israel. That's too small. That's too small. Your commission is much bigger than that. I'm going to give you as a light to the Gentiles and you'll bring salvation to the whole earth. The Septuagint gives us a slightly different sense. It's that it's a great thing that you've been called to be my servant because you'll raise up the tribes of Jacob, you'll restore the preserve and preserve Israel, and you'll be a light unto the Gentiles and bring salvation to the whole earth. But I think that both of these senses means really the Lord Jesus Christ had two tasks. The first task was to recover the Jews from their sin and hypocrisy and bring them back to worship of the true and only God. The second action, the second thing that he needed to do is extend the knowledge of the true religion to a darkened pagan world. And in doing so, he would bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly what happened. You know, when when Simeon was holding the little baby in his hands. He knew that this was the commission of of this baby, this Lord, this, uh, this little baby that he was holding. He knew that both of these were his commission because in Luke 2 and verse 32, he said he would be a light to lighten the Gentiles and 
the glory of Israel. Also, the Lord gave his all during his ministry, and he preached to both Jew and Gentile in areas such as Capernaum and and Tyre and Sidon. The work continued even after his ascension into heaven, and you've got here a marginal reference to Acts 13 and verse 47, where Paul and Barnabas quote directly from Isaiah 49 verse 6 and confirm that their commission was to be a light to the Gentiles and bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And you know, we're continuing that work even today. When we're preaching the gospel, we're continuing the work of bringing salvation, the message of salvation, and we'll keep doing that until our Lord returns and fulfills this prophecy of Isaiah. And so the second servant song can be summarized as being split into three verses. The first verse in verses 1 to 3 is where the servant proclaims that he's been called from the womb and acknowledges that God has given him all the tools necessary to complete his task in in redeeming the Jew and Gentile to bring glory to God. The second verse in Isaiah 49 and verse 4, the servant's work with Israel would be discouraging and his rejection by the Jews gives a sense that the labor is in vain and the effort is for naught. But in the third verse, in verses 5 and 6, the servant is consoled and with the promise that his work will extend beyond Israel to embrace the Gentiles, bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. And verses 7 to 12 now shift from the servant speaking to Yahweh speaking to the servant and giving comfort to the servant. Comfort because of the feelings of despondency and the lack of response from the nation of Israel. And, you know, it doesn't specifically say that he's talking to the servant in these verses. It says that he's speaking to the one who is despised and the nation of, and the one that the nation of Israel abhorred. But there's no doubt this can be talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. The word rendered abhorreth means for an abomination. And it's more fully expressed in Isaiah 53 as the servant was despised and rejected of men. You know, we considered earlier the examples of discouragement that the Lord faced during his ministry. But it's clear from the gospel records that he was absolutely abhorred by the Jews. He was dis- despised because, because of his parentage and his education and, and his doctrines. He was publicly rejected by the nation. The Jewish leaders condemned his preaching. They delivered him to the Romans to be executed in the most shameful way. Even today, most Jews hold his name in utter contempt and reject the idea that salvation comes through him whom they crucified. And what a contrast we have in verse 7 of a man who was despised and rejected on the one hand, but on the other hand, he's honoured and he's, he's worshipped by kings and princes. So a promise of the future. Being despised and abhorred were what he experienced in his first ministry. Being honoured and worshipped is what he will experience in his second ministry. And, you know, when you think about the three time periods of the Lord Jesus Christ, so uh, the three time periods being his first ministry, Uh, his second ministry, uh, and now we've got this period in between those two, which is now his time while he's in heaven. When you have a look at these three time periods, there's actually a progression of exactly what we read here, where he goes from being uh, abhorred to where he has kings worshipping him. Well, for example, if you have a look at some of the references to the Lord Jesus Christ in his first ministry, you will not find a single reference to a king or a prince falling down and worshipping him. You've got references here of uh, people, the common folk, falling down and worshipping him. You've got example of a leper falling down and worshipping him. You've got an example of disciples falling down and worshipping him. You've got another person coming and falling down and worshipping him, but there's no reference of any kings or princes falling down and worshipping him. What about about now? What about between his first and his second ministry while he's in heaven? Well, 
you know, there's a little bit of progression. It really, you could say, started from Constantine where he introduced, introduced the Christianity more so. And, and you've got Constantine, he's really a turning point. Um, he took over the role as patron for the Christian faith. He supported the church financially. He promoted Christians to positions of, uh, of power. He gave the church lots of money. And Theodius is known as the, the one who really um, made Christianity the Roman religion. So reverence to Christ was increasing. And, you know, even a little bit closer to home, uh, Queen Victoria in around 1902 or 1903, when she was asked, well, what would you do if the Lord Jesus Christ returned? And she said, I would love to lay my crown at his feet. So, you know, there's a little bit of kings and princes, maybe just taking a little bit more of an interest. But of course, that's really just a glimpse of what we have to come. And it's really during his second ministry when he returns to the earth and establishes God's kingdom that this verse is going to be fulfilled where you've got kings and princes worshipping him. Here's three references, Revelation 1 verses 5 to 6. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. That's how he's described. He's the ruler of kings on earth, which means kings and princes are worshipping him. In Daniel 7 verses 3 to 14, you've got all peoples and nations and languages serving him. So within that Within that context are the kings and the princes worshipping Christ. And Revelation 21 verse 24, right at the end of the Bible, the nations of them that are saved shall walk in the light of it and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honour into it. So these kings and these princes are doing honour and worshipping the king of the earth. And we're told that the reason why the servant will be elevated to this position is because Yahweh is faithful and he's selected the servant to accomplish this and to be a light of the Gentiles. And it's really a point that we shouldn't miss. Yahweh is faithful in the fulfillment of his promises and he absolutely is going to bring this to pass. The servant was obedient unto death and the grave could not hold him. He was despised of men, but loved of the Father who did exactly what he promised he would do. He raised him from the dead. He changed him from mortal to immortal. He drew him up into heaven to be exalted at the right hand of God. And you know, this is going to apply in a very similar fashion to us. We don't deserve to be elevated with eternal life. We're not going to earn a place in the kingdom of God. But Yahweh is faithful And he has promised us eternal life and a place in his kingdom. And he's promised it to all his faithful servants. And he's absolutely going to fulfill his promise because he is faithful. And Yahweh continues speaking to the servant in verse 8 and says, In an acceptable time have I heard thee. You'll notice that there's a marginal reference here to Psalm 69 verse 13. And it's got to be one of the most beautiful connections. You know, if you turn over to Psalm 69, you can really start to see the connection here. Because what you've got is you've got in Psalm 69, verses 13 to 25, the servant asking... And then it's linked to Isaiah chapter 49 because you're hearing Yahweh's response. For the sake of time, we won't read through Psalm 69 verse 13 through to 25, but you can see it in verse 13. As for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. So here we have the reference in Psalm 69 to what was said just then in Isaiah 49. It's the servant asking and it's Isaiah 49 is Yahweh answering. So you could go through uh, all of the verses down to verse 25 and you can pick out certain points that are actually answered by Yahweh in Isaiah 49. 
So let's just have a look at it on the slide here. So we've got that link in verse 13, in an acceptable time. So here's the servant asking, in an acceptable time. And Yahweh responding in Isaiah 49 verse 8, in an acceptable time. So you can see the connection. The RSV says it's a time of favor. In, in Psalm 69, the servant says, hear me. Or as the ESV renders it, answer me. And in Isaiah 49 verse 8, Yahweh says, I heard you. Or the ESV, I've answered you. And here in verse 14 of Psalm 69, he says, deliver me. And in, in Isaiah 49 verse 8, he says, I have helped thee. Here in Psalm 69, the servant says, hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. And in Isaiah 49, Yahweh answers, I have preserved thee. Here in Psalm 69, the servant asks, deliver me from mine enemies. And in Isaiah 49 verse 8, he says, I've delivered you because I'm giving you as a covenant of the people. Here in Psalm 69, he says, let their habitation be desolate in verse 25. And in Psalm 49, Yahweh says to establish the earth and to cause to inherit the desolate heritage. So yes, I've made them desolate and you're going to inherit the desolate. And so we've got this beautiful asking in Psalm 69 with the answering of Yahweh in Isaiah 49. You know, back in Isaiah chapter 49 and in verse 9, Yahweh has invited those prisoners who are bound and in darkness to go forth and show themselves. You know, we're all prisoners of sin and death. We've taken the first steps out of darkness by responding to Yahweh's call. But here in verses 9 to 12 in Isaiah, we're given the vision of the servant as the good shepherd who who can and will set the prisoners free, totally and absolutely for eternity. Now, there's two references that if you wish, if you like to, you can write down um, here in Isaiah 49. There are two references that link this idea of the servant being given as a covenant in verse 8 with the prisoners being set free in verse 9. And what we do is we get this picture of the prisoners being set free by the good shepherd. So next to the phrase, a covenant of the people, in verse 8, you might want to mark in Hebrews 13 and verse 20, because I'm certain that the Apostle Paul had Isaiah 49 in mind when he penned Hebrews 13 and verse 20, because it links the covenant mentioned here in Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 8 with the vision of the ser- servant as the good shepherd, which we're about to see in verses 9 to 12. He says there, now the God of peace who brought again from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep with the blood of an eternal covenant even our Lord Jesus. And secondly, next to the word prisoners, in verse 9, you might want to mark in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 to 12. Because Zechariah 9, verses 9 to 12, connects the blood of the covenant and the prisoners being set free. It projects our thoughts into the future. It's a time after the Lord Jesus Christ has returned on earth He's bringing with him salvation. There's no more war. There's great rejoicing in Zion. There's shouting in Jerusalem. And what does Zechariah say? He says, as for thee also, because of the blood of the covenant, I have set free thy prisoners from the pit wherein is no water. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. And here in verses 9 to 12 in Isaiah is the vision of the good shepherd setting the prisoners free. Well, here's the good shepherd. The good shepherd has given, has, has been given as a covenant to the people of verse 8. The good shepherd will provide for the needs and feed them along the way and the high places that were once barren in verse 9. The good shepherd will change them so they don't experience the weaknesses of the flesh such as hunger and thirst in verse 10. 
just as he promised in John 6 and verse 35. The good shepherd will remove all external threats and influences that previously tried to sear and burn them. Threats and influences that once were unbearable as the searing heat and the burning sun of verse 10. The good shepherd will provide leadership and guidance to them with compassion, as the word should be translated in verse 10 where it says mercy. That's freedom, brethren and sisters. Unbound by sin and mortality, unloosed from the prison of the grave, because the good shepherd will fulfill his role completely when he returns to the earth and establishes God's kingdom. And so many people will flow to him and worship him. Yahweh is going to make sure of it because look at what he promises in verse 11. He wants to make sure that nothing can stop the saints from from going. He says the mountains will be away, the highways will be raised up and visible. You know, the contemporary English version, maybe that gives us a really extreme view of it, but it gives us a really good picture. It says, I will level the mountains and make roads. Either way, the path to respond to the call of the good shepherd and flock to him has been made easy here in this verse 11. And the prisoners who are set free, we're told they're going to flow from the far, from the north, from the west, from the land of Sinem. This is the statement of the fulfillment of the promises that were made in verses 6 and 7. And if you read through all the, uh, the various commentaries on this verse, you're going to get a lot of possibilities. So far, well, that could be Babylon, Persia, countries east of Judah, north, well, that could be the regions north, north of Palestine, west, well, it's the Hebrew from the sea, the land of Sinem, well, that could be a remote country, south in general, Persia, South of Palestine, a city of Egypt, China, people of the emperor of the center of the world, maybe India. But you know what I imagine when I read this voice, uh, read this verse? I think about, you know what? It's people from all over the globe converging to Zion to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the mission of the servant fulfilled. It's what will happen when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and establishes the kingdom of God. And I think the Lord Jesus Christ would have taken great comfort when he read these words of Isaiah. He would read about the qualities of the servant that Yahweh had given him. He'd read about his despondency that he would experience. He'd read about his trust in Yahweh. He'd read about the ultimate victory he would have in bringing salvation to both Jew and Gentile, to all ends of the earth. And he would have looked forward to that time after his resurrection when all these things would have come to pass. And with that vision, it's no wonder that verse 13 appears in this prophecy. When we read this, it feels almost like a bridge between the section that we've just considered And the section that we're going to have a look at in the next class where we see Zion's response. And that's why I've color-coded this separately to both of those sections. It's, It's almost like this spontaneous praise from the mouth of the prophet Isaiah. And no doubt the Lord Jesus Christ would have had similar feelings to this. Isaiah can imagine what it would be like when the promises of verses 6 to 7 are fulfilled. He imagines Jew and Gentile flowing to Zion to worship the king. He imagines kings raising up in reverence. He imagines earthly princes worshipping. He imagines the servant as a light to the world. He imagines the salvation unto the ends of the earth. And with his, his heart almost bursting over with joy, he interposes a song of praise as the heavens sing and the earth is joyful. That There's a joyful singing because Yahweh has comforted his people and he, and he has brought mercy upon the afflicted. Now, what a joyful time that will be. But what we're going to see next week is Zion doesn't feel so elated. Zion can't seem to get into the spirit of this wonderful praise. 
They feel rejected and they're forsaken. And that's what we're going to see in our next class. But the vision of praise here in verse 13, well, that's how we want to end our night. And, you know, I skipped over a particular reference from an earlier verse. We're told in the margin in verse 10 that there's a a reference and it's cited in Revelation 7 verses 16 and 17. And I think, again, that is a wonderful connection with not only Isaiah 49, but also the spirit that you get into when you look at verse 13. And when you have a look at Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, you've got a great multitude. Who is that multitude? Well, it's the freed prisoners that are no longer in darkness. In verse 10 of Revelation 7, you've got the salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne of the Lamb. And that's connected here in verse 6, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. You've got a multitude in verse 15, are they which come out of a great tribulation, they've washed their robes and made white with the blood of the Lamb. And here in Isaiah in in verse 13, the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. And then in verses 16 and 17, you've got the link here specifically to verse 10. They hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away tears from their eyes. Well, may it be, brethren and sisters and and young people, as we go about the week, let's consider the things of this prophecy, the qualities of the servant, the comforts from Yahweh, the future vision of the praise in verse 13. That's going to be expressed globally because salvation will come unto the end of the earth.